All right, thanks everyone for waiting around. I'm uh, just trying to um, do a recording of this. So we're actually doing it um, through Google, the same Hangout environment that we were doing before, but no one's actually logged on at the moment. So this is actually just gonna go out. It does go out in real time, similarly to the way that normal Hangouts work, but if people investigate uh, Google Plus or Google Hangouts, you'll find that you can actually very cheaply uh, do a broadcast of your discussion, your live discussion if you want to. It's a little bit delayed. It's like two or three seconds delayed. So if we turned on the sound, which we're not going to do, we may actually get a little bit distracted by the delay. But it's good to know that you can do a what's called a, a hangout live with a small group up to about 10 people. And you can do a... a um, uh, a hangout broadcast, which can be to as many people as may need to actually connect to it. The hang they're not that dissimilar, they're very kind of, they look the same. So I'm just introducing that idea. But the second one, the, the broadcast hangout, will actually, uh, can be stored, you can keep it, whereas the first one, that normal hangout, usually just disappears, like a Skype chat or other things, so it doesn't, it doesn't last. We can actually delete it afterwards, but um, it is a bit uh, distracting to try and listen to it at the same time. So don't try and connect to it now, because Peter will actually sound completely out of sync to the live room. The people who can who might come in will just be a bit delayed. About three seconds after Peter speaks, it will actually send the signal to him. So we might have to wait for them if we ask them a question. <coughs> sure. Yeah. All right. So I'll hand over to Peter. We're going to look at, um, uh, hopefully, Peter's looked at some of, some of the readings. I've noticed that the uh, the Ning area is kind of active. So p please keep contributing. If you do want to actually take a, a session, make sure you go to the schedule and sign up. There's quite a few people signed up already, so that's really good. But I'll hand over to Peter and we'll get started on something he's he's got as uh, some video clips and stuff yeah there's yeah, a couple correct. i am um, how do i turn the other screens on or a oh, screen sorry, on yeah. somewhere is it just through here yep if you want to turn them just that one yep yeah. all right cool so i just did um i read through the first two readings and gave up on the third one because it was a bit long-winded um, and, the, and I've really done a, um, a bit of a summary just of the first reading, the um, Fisher reading, just because it kind of resonated more than the other reading was. The other reading I thought was like the outcomes and the findings and the conclusions were a little bit obvious, you know, you, yeah. sort of, you found what you expected to find or I did. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the distributed intelligence, uh, the transcending the individual human mind article from Fisher. Um, and I keep coming back a fair bit to the quote right at the start, which is the power of the unaided individual mind is highly overrated, that he's drawn from elsewhere. Um, and the whole article essentially is really about, um, you know, what you can do with others and the power of others in different ways, I guess. And he defines those different ways. I need to remember which computer I'm using. Um, in those four areas, the spatial, temporal, conceptual, and technological. For the spatial, he talks about um, the notion of shared concerns rather than a shared location. And his examples of those are the open source community, places like Wikipedia, um, you know, commons kind of spaces where people are um, in different locations, but all share a, a similar idea. So again, that's the notion of it being spatial is fairly obvious, as is the notion of his next one, which is the temporal. Um, the temporal one, obviously, is time related, and he talks about design being something that happens over many years and is more evolutionary rather than sort of fast acting. You know, it's something that just takes time, moves slowly. Team members can change in that process. Um, and the challenge is to carry those ideas forward, so to carry the vision and the ideas from the original people who started that design process forward through the process, particularly because he says that designers aren't great documenters of things. So, you know, they, they might be very creative, but they're not terribly good at the paperwork. And, you know, I'd probably fall into the not very good at paperwork category. Um, 
and he talk, he uses an example of uh, kind of the idea of standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, so he uses the, uh, the suggestion that um, Einstein's ideas wouldn't have been possible without Newton's ideas first, and that there's a challenge now, um, particularly with the notion of copyright um, and the way that copyright keeps being extended, that, that it's really difficult to have um, to be able to stand on the shoulders of giants because we can't really use the ideas of others as freely as we may have in the past. So, um, and the couple of videos I've put in later are kind of related to that. Um, then he goes on to talk about the conceptual and that kind of helps tie in the article from uh, Lave and Wenger from last week around communities of practice and comparing them to communities of interest. Um, he mentioned school technicians, I think, in his example, um, which I used to work for the education department and they used to have like huge meetings of the school technicians. So they all got the same idea of how they were going to deal with an issue, how they were going to solve that problem. Um, one of the risks he said with those communities of practice is groupthink and you know, you'll notice that in a leadership meeting or your grade four meeting or whatever. Um, I go to a, an IT teaching network in our region and we all tend to focus on the same sorts of things and get tied into the same ideas. Um, but he compares that and contrasts it to a community of interest, um, which often pulls on communities of practice and has uh, little elements of those communities of practice within it um, around, and he described it as a collective concern to resolve a particular problem rather than uh, all having the same level of knowledge. So one, one of you might be really good at the design phase, one of you is really good at the uh, documentation, one of you is really good at the, um, at whatever. So, um, so he suggests that that's like a community of communities. Um, and he talks about software development as an example of that. So there might be a team of designers, a team of users, a team of marketers, a team of psychologists, you know, focus groups, programmers, and so on. Um, and members in that type of community are seen as both expert in some things and novices in other areas. Uh, he then talks about the technological aspects, um, which he's quite brief on, but he suggests that though those are embedded in artifacts, particularly books, um, or computational artifacts. And then I return to that phrase again, that the power of the unaided individual mind is highly overrated. Um, and that led me to think about um, some stuff I'd done with, the, um, with my school, with the Catholics, last, the Catholic Ed Office last year. Um, and we worked with Note Hosh, what is that page? who were just a group who facilitated some conversations around design thinking at our school. Um, and so the design thinking process fits nicely with these communities of interest and communities of practice ideas. Um, and so it pulls in all four of those elements, the spatial, temporal, conceptual and technological. If I put, oh, no, yeah, probably don't, it's all right. I don't actually need volume. Goes. I'm just going to, which reminded me of a video that I saw a couple of years ago by a guy called Kirby Ferguson, who um, put together a video that talks about creativity and standing on the shoulders of giants, and he called it Everything is a Remix. Um, and maybe one we could get it to go out as well, which will actually, well, maybe not because it won't, we won't have copyright. That's okay. Don't do it. That's why it's embedded. It's like yeah, legally it won't embedded. It's not going out. It won't be embedded. Cool. Yeah. Um, I just thought I'd jump to about the 10 minute mark. Oh, you do get volume. Cool. Appreciate which brings us to... Even now, Star Wars endures as a work of impressive imagination, but many of its individual components are as recognizable as the samples in a remix. The foundation for Star Wars comes from Joseph Campbell. He popularized the structures of myth in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Star Wars follows the outline of the monomyth, which consists of stages like the call to adventure, supernatural aid, the belly of the whale, the road of trials, the meeting with the goddess, and a bunch more. Also huge influences were the Flash Gordon serials from the 30s and Japanese director Akira Kurosawa. Star Wars plays much like an updated version of Flash Gordon, right down to the soft wipes and the opening titles design. From Kurosawa, we get Masters of Spiritual Martial Arts, a low-ranking bickering duo, more soft wipes, a beneath the floorboards hideaway, and a boastful baddie getting his arm chopped off. You just watch yourself. We want to win 
I am the descendants of the twelve system. <laughs> Anyway, you get the idea. So, the, like, he, he talks about how, you know, though the Star Wars stories, the Star Wars trilogies weren't possible without using the ideas of others and without using the images of others and the thoughts of others um, to get there. But he questions whether we can, um, whether students in particular and teachers um, and lecturers and professors can use that culture of remix effectively in school, given that we're forbidden from using the work of others effectively in many ways unless we claim fair use which we don't really have a fair claim, claim to here in Australia. Australia. <clears throat> when so, you look at it, so I just so happened to read an article on this metal floss, you know, 26 things you didn't know about Star Wars and things, and they mentioned all these things, but I've never seen it so graphically like that, that, you know, they should be jumping up and down and saying, let's cook a burrow, sits in the old gum tree, give us yeah, some money. You yeah. Know, the, the, uh, yeah, that's, 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 Standing on the shoulder of giants. That's yeah. What's worked? Yeah. Some of the scenes are you know, pretty much shot for shot. They're fascinating. But it's not just about Star Wars. That video. It's actually really used. It talks about music and history and you know culture and um, eventually moves on to other things. Um, his description uh, or Fisher's description is that um, the idea of explo exploiting and building on the voices of the past to enhance social creativity is important for our overall cultural heritage. And I thought that was one of the most useful quotes in his um, article, his assessment. I'm just gonna jump on to the next slide. Again, oh, this will probably go, we probably don't need volume. Um, it led me to an article or a video that I remember watching, which was a presentation by Lawrence Lessig, who's a lecturer, I think, in law at Harvard, maybe. Um, and he talked in 2002 about um, free culture and he was kind of the innovator of creative commons um, and the idea behind you know licensing your work so that others could use it so that they can open things up and he his argument in this essentially is that the entire Walt Disney Empire is built on stealing other people's ideas but they're very strong on making sure that you don't steal their ideas so um, and to the point where in America the um, the Copyright Act in America is actually referred to by a lot of lawyers as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act because every time Mickey Mouse is about to come out of copyright, the Disney lawyers go back to court and extend the term of copyright. So it's now at life plus 70 years, um, where it was a, a originally sort of life plus, it's just the life of the author, I guess. Nine, nine years years or so, like so, so now it's some ridiculous time and we can't really use it. Sounds like that. Yeah. Um, and he keeps repeating a mantra in that, and he's got four points, and they are that creativity and innovation always builds on the past, that the past always tries to control the creativity that builds upon it, that free societies enable the future by limiting the past, and that our society is less and less a free society um, because of the way we enact those laws. Um, and his, the video is actually really useful. It goes for about half an hour, if you can be bothered and you've got the time. Um, which brought me back to his refrain, sorry, you need to go there, which is that the power of the unaided individual mind is highly overrated. So we need the ideas of others and our students need the ideas of others. Um, which led to my question, which is how might our students utilise the minds of others to translate, transcend the limitations of their own minds? I really just really worded as a good teacher does the first opening bit. So I guess how might our students utilise the minds of others? This is your chance to <coughs> tell me what you think. Do you want Do you want them to answer you right away, or would you like no, to let's have a quick discussion? Right have no, a discussion. No, no, Good idea. Have, at your tables. A table, because people need to just sort of get yep. their heads around what you've said. So if we just focusing on that question, just quickly amongst the, the group at the table, we can have a chat about it here, or right. you can join the table if you like. Um, just sit, we want to, you know, see whether we can answer this question. How, if we think about some of the things that came up in those readings, um, how might we, uh, you know, use other people, the minds of others? Um, and it might be that some of the things we talked about last week or even the first week might actually help. So have a go and we'll see what you think in a second, maybe about five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Have you got, you got more to, to talk about? I just thought... 
No, that's good. That's fantastic. You did a great job. That the video is fantastic. I'll have to go and have a look at that other one. It looks really good. Now, I actually tried to log on to your link. It's in yeah. Google Docs, isn't it? Yeah. But I think you probably don't have me included because I left it. It depends how it was. I made it. Right. So I'm not going with you reading all the account. I think I actually came in as. Um, I think about the Ted Unimail at Gmail is because I actually don't get a Gmail account, so that's why I'm Ted, so Ted Unimail, one word, at Gmail, gmail.com. So just in front of I know that that was good that we didn't actually broadcast it. Um, well, I think it's still sitting there in the background. Yeah, good. So we're actually running. Um, one of the things that um, we can do is have chat here, and I might actually just um, go back to the uh, slides. So I can go back to, yeah, okay, so it's the slides. I just wanted to see whether anyone has um, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we do if they go to it, they go back to the start. So it's great for this. So, so what actually happens, I should explain this to everyone, is it's an additional kind of feature that Google just gives you for free. Yes. And um, you basically pay enormous amount of money to, to just have a um, system storage and, and broadcast. So broadcast is the best thing because 10 is a round level of almost everything. So you can't get more than that in Skype. You can't get more than that, obviously, in the Google Plus sort of standard. Yeah. And it's basically recording us right now. So what I've just said has actually gone out, or it might actually go out if I get in. I haven't seen anyone. Okay. I think it's a discussion in a minute just to see how we go. I don't know whether I want to turn this around, but maybe if it is kind of good, which is, I'll, I'll just manipulate it and uh, distract you. Um, but, but you can, you can uh, if you'd like to lead it, you'll see what different tables have come up. Yeah, what's the time? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's me. So this is risk taking and I don't know. I think if I press stop, I think I stop it and I can still start it again. I'll just see whether I, you know, it doesn't matter.